welcome you today to another of these uh, services uh, led by myself on behalf and for our, our entire church. My prayer is that today we will know afresh the blessing that the Lord will bestow upon us. So as we seek to come into the Lord's presence uh, just this week, we had received a, a little note of encouragement from uh, a songwriter, a hymn writer that my congregation in Mays had had some connection with in the past, uh, Paul Bolosh. Uh, perhaps I would just like to use that greeting now as a lead-in to worship for all of us. Well, hello to all my friends at Mays Presbyterian. This is Paul Bolosh. And uh, hello, Robert, to your family and everyone there. I have fond memories of being at Maze. And um, these are crazy times, crazy days, but I know you're gathering online. You're still seeking the Lord, pressing in. And um, one of the songs Robert said, hey, uh, maybe a little word behind uh, Psalm 92. You know, a lot of songs are written from the Psalms. And that was one in particular when I just read that. Psalm 92 verse one says, it is good Praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. That's how it started. Let's see. It is good to praise you, Lord. Make music to your name, O Most High. It is good to praise you, Lord. Amen. Make music to your name, O Most High, O Most High. It goes on to say, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. So it is a good thing. It's good. So let's keep singing through these hard times. Continue to press into God and look out for one another. I look forward to seeing many of you, hopefully in the fall. Okay, so God bless you.
let's join together as we pray. Let's pray. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17. Behold, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Lord, just as we continue to reflect on those few words from the prophet Isaiah, we're reminded just of a few things there, that you're going to do something entirely new and wonderful, and that we, we your people, have been made to live in a world of new delight, that we will be a people of delight. And also, Lord, that you take delight in us. Oh God, help us not to be so short-sighted that we forget all these wonderful realities. Open the eyes of our hearts that we might be able to see the first fruits of the new creation, that world which in a sense has already arrived in the person and the work of your son, Jesus. May your joy be our strength. May we live in your presence. May we understand that we are loved fully and completely. And because the gospel is true, help us to live courageously and boldly for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Boys and girls, I'm just going to have a few moments just talking to you at this point and just thinking, maybe as with everyone else at the moment, we get a little bit tired, a little bit impatient because we've spent so long indoors in our houses, not going too far. Do you get impatient with things? Maybe when you're walking and you're out with your mum and dad, you want to go somewhere and you want to get finished, and suddenly someone's coming down the other side of the street, and your mum and dad stop, and they shout over at those other people, and they're talking, and you're getting really, really impatient because you want to move on. Or maybe some of you have got a birthday coming up, and it's hard to wait for that birthday. That might be next week, might be next month, It's hard to wait for things. And yet, so often in the Bible, we're told to wait and to be good at waiting. The Bible also tells me not only to wait for God, but also to pray and to be waiting and watching to see God giving the answers to those prayers. Now, sometimes that's really, really hard because... Like me, you probably find it really hard to wait for things. And yet I wondered if you could maybe try something like this at home. I've got a plate. And on this plate, I've drawn some glue lines. And then immediately I put some salt over it. And to see if I can make a nice picture or a design with that. And I've got some uh, really wet and gloopy paint. And when we do these things, we can make nice things, but sometimes we still have to to wait for it. Maybe I put a little bit in there and I can see my paint running a little bit and it looks really good and it looks really nice and I can maybe make that move and I can do lots of things with my paints. And I mean, but the thing is with doing any sort of art is that you have to wait. I've got another, another color that I can join in. Now to make art beautiful, you have to be able to mix it and you have to be able to see what happens. I'm going to do a little bit more. I may move that color around a little bit. You can see that happening. Maybe I've got a little bit of blue. 
and then see how my colors move and change. Add a little bit there. Move it back. You can see how one color changes into another. And art, maybe you enjoy doing a little bit of art and it's always really good to do that. But what I used to hate so much was waiting to see the whole thing finished. And yet when something is completely finished, it's worth waiting for. Now maybe you can make something that's even a little bit more attractive than mine and a little bit fancier and you can see how all the colors change into one another and they blend. And yet to do that, you have to wait even though we find that really, really hard. And in the Bible, and we want to encourage you, if you want to look up in your Bible, Colossians chapter four, verse two, which talks about us being a people, mums and dads, boys and girls, people who are devoted to praying. That just means you really want to keep on doing. But that verse goes on and it says to be watchful and thankful. Keep on looking to see what God is doing. So maybe there's lots of things today that you can be praying for. You can be praying for other people. You can be praying for your family. You can be praying maybe some of the boys and girls go to your school. Maybe you don't, don't see them just as much. You can be praying for your church. And a lot of these answers may not just come immediately, but from that verse in the Bible, it says, watch to see what God is doing. And I want to encourage you just to do that, even when it's really hard at times to be patient. And we've got all the thoughts that we have and we want to see God doing something immediately. But God says, I want you to watch and see what I'm doing. Actually, we're going to sing a song now. I don't know if you know this song or not. It's one that I really, really enjoy listening to and, and, and entering into. And there's one line maybe doesn't seem to say very much, but so many of those other words are really, really good where it encourages me simply to know that all of my life is about following Jesus and putting Jesus first in my life.
but also to share with you. And even before I pray, I want to shake your hand. I can thank you. Thanks for 50 years and looking forward and praying God's blessing upon you and all your family. <laughs>
uh, Habakkuk chapter 3, where we have been reading over this past number of weeks. And as we have these final three verses of this passage in front of you today, we're still right now in the midst of all the trouble that has been going on. But as one article I was reading recently was saying and reminding me, you really know you're in trouble when, and it gives a, a, a few number of suggestions. One of them was when your twin forgets your birthday or when you turn on the local news and the only thing that it's talking about are emergency ways out or perhaps one that requires a little bit more imagination that maybe you wake up in the middle of the night and suddenly you find out that your water bed has sprung a leak, only to remind yourself that actually you don't have a water bed. Well, you might need to think about that one. We've come to the end of the prophecy of Habakkuk. And yet today, as you look at these words, and these are, as it were, how the story finishes, would you think that this is a good ending. If you were writing this, if this was your story, is this how you would want to finish it? Well, in some ways, there's something positive here. There's some aspects of joy. There, there, is, there is a hint and a note of rejoicing in God. But actually, as I put all of this together, the, the the reality that I have is that the situation that Habakkuk is facing is just as bad as it ever was. What he's having to live through, the situation that he's in, it's really as bad as ever. After all, the, the enemy the enemy is still on the horizon. They're still threatening and their approach is every bit as definite. But where the change actually comes... Well, that change, it's, it's in the prophet himself. It's in Habakkuk's own mind and experience. I mean, if I read verse 16, let's read verse 16 together. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come upon the nation invading us. So maybe as I'm just thinking here, what I'm going to try and draw out are, are maybe just some of those changes, I think, that have come about in Habakkuk's own life and experience, attitudes that now describe him. And the first of those, and one that I'm coming across here is just this idea that I think he's got a sense of respect for God. Now, having questioned God so much. He was wondering, what is God up to? Now that Habakkuk has actually heard back from God, those words, that answer has had a huge impact upon him because, well, verse 16, that, that verse describes him near to collapse. It, it describes him shaking like a leaf. He was speechless. He was profoundly shaken, and he's, he's got this renewed respect for God. And actually, that sense, that experience that I think in many ways describes Habakkuk here is not that unusual in many of the other characters in the Bible that we come across when they've encountered God in a new way. I'm going to think of just a couple now because Job, his reaction actually isn't that dissimilar from Habakkuk's. If I read from Job 42, 5 and 6, where he says, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. You'll also remember, I'm sure, Isaiah's response to that moment when he had a very intimate experience of God. Remember that moment, Isaiah chapter 6, when he's in the throne room? Now, Isaiah didn't go around afterwards telling everyone what happened to that because the emotions were so severe. 
where he said, woe to me, I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And there's also glimpses of the glory of Jesus in the New Testament. At one point after a fishing trip, Peter exclaims in Luke chapter 5, says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Or what about John in the final book of the New Testament? And he sees the ascended Jesus standing amongst the lampstands. Revelation 1 verse 17 Here's the the reaction that it it caused in his life. It says, when I saw him, I fell at his his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. Now, over the last number of weeks, as I've been listening as I've been reading what's been going on in the news and I've been trying to make sense for myself what's been happening, I've noticed something maybe just slightly different. Perhaps you've noticed it too. Maybe you've even experienced it yourself. I've noticed it in conversations. I have noticed it in the news. I've noticed it in some newspaper articles. And it's to do with what I might call or refer as the the jolt, the jolt that this COVID experience has brought into our lives because it's very real and it's very deep. But one of the outcomes of that in many ways, I think, has been people's experience or reaction to God because a lot of the time, People have found that they didn't need to think about God very much, but maybe just in the midst of all that's going on, there's something happening here where people realize that maybe up to this point, they've put God further down their list of priorities, but suddenly they're realizing and they're wondering, what is God saying? What is God saying to me through whatever is happening, through what is going on in my life? What is God saying? Now, I can look at all the the inconsistencies in my own life and the uh, hypocrisies even in my own life. And I realize that actually there are times when I haven't had the respect for God that I should have had, that, that, that I've maybe treated God a, a little bit more trivially. I've wondered to myself, have I really got the full respect for God that he, re- he deserves? Because if I truly did, it would impact what I'm doing and that I would do things differently from what I'm doing. I mean, are there not times when we should simply just step back and listen to what God is saying and in those moments to have that respect for God? And what I learn even here in this passage is that it is God who enables us to live in the present. And it's by having this respect for God that we are enabled to live in the present with what is going on. Actually, maybe even to use a phrase that I used in an earlier sermon about living or staying in the waiting room when we're having to endure things that we would rather not endure. And yet, when we have a new respect for God an understanding for God and what God is doing, we then can live in those moments, not with anxiety, not with with, with fear or uncertainty, but being able to do that with a, a new trust in God, knowing that God will bring about these things to pass in our lives and that God ultimately, he's still in control no matter what happens. And I can do that not simply thinking about the big things of life, for instance, when Jesus Christ is going to return again and, we're, and he's going to bring in a new heavens and a new earth and I know that I can trust him for that, but also to be able to trust God for the small things of life, the daily 
anxieties and fears that we have, that we can simply leave those with him and to know, Lord, that you will look after those things for us. So I notice this about Habakkuk, that he, that he has this new and renewed respect for God. But also, I see in verses 17 and 18 that he can now rejoice in God. Let's, let's read 17 and 18. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, and though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Now those words may be very familiar to you. It's sort of staple diet in many ways for many of our harvest services. We're, we're familiar with those words. We've, we've heard them so often. And also in some ways because they're so poetic and they're so graphic uh, that actually we don't actually think of the significance of what those words and somehow they still bypass us. But what is Habakkuk actually describing here in these words? And, and as I think about that, I, I have to say, for him, it is massive. This, this is huge. Because what Habakkuk is describing here, it's the effects of the Babylonian army, their war machine. And the verse is actually very clear. It says, Everything has been taken away. Now, he begins with what we might call the apparent luxuries of life. Here it's described as things like grapes and, and figs and olives, but it moves on after that to what we might say are, are the more thing, the, the staple things of our ordinary diet. It's describing actually that there's no food left. This is not simply a devastated economy. This is everything that is gone. And in light of that, it becomes even more apparent. And the, the significance of that simple little word, yet. Where in verse 16, he says, yet I will wait patiently. Or in verse 18, yet. I will rejoice. Now again, other people in the Bible, their stories, we read them, and they too have been able to say things that are very similar to Habakkuk's. Again, it's less like Job, where Job expresses, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Or it's like Paul in the New Testament when Paul describes his life and he says, we are hard pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. Now, if I go back and again, just think about Job, I'm reminded of the day that those people came to des describe for Job the events of the early tragedies of his life. That day, when they came to tell him that he had lost his entire family and that he had lost his wealth. What was Job's response? Job chapter one, verse 21. This is how Job describes it. Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. You know, it takes a huge degree of faith to be able to say something like that in the midst of sorrow and distress. And yet words like that, I, I believe, are very relevant to us, even in our experience right now, because perhaps with a, a lesser feeling, we're describing something of that in our experience of these days. So what was it that enabled people like Habakkuk or Job to respond to God in the way in which they did? What did Habakkuk have that he was now able to rejoice in? You know, it's not his possessions. 
It was not his circumstances. It's not what we might call the, the blessings of God. It was simply that he was now able to rejoice in the only thing that he had left, and that was God. And yet, as people so often remind us, we can only do that when suddenly we realize that actually the only thing left that we have is God. I read a story just recently of a remarkable Christian from Kosovo. A long time ago, before the war, he was a very successful businessman. He had a couple of homes. And yet, just before all the, the trouble in Kosovo, his family was forced to leave, but he, he decided to stay on and look after what he had. But eventually, he too was forced to leave. And then he had to go and try and find his family. And he found them in Albania where they had been given food by a small Christian agency. Later, after the war, he tried to go back to Kosovo to see what was left. And when he traveled back, he, he saw that everything was destroyed. Everything was gone. There was nothing at all left. And even there, in his destitution and in his sorrow, he saw something he recognized, which was a little white van with a blue fish on the side. And he recognized that that little van belonged to the same small Christian mission that had helped his family in Albania. And he went to them for help. And through their efforts, he came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and his Savior. And then writing off his experiences now, what he said is that I had nothing, but I found that actually in Jesus, I had everything. Now those words are powerful and they do make us reflect. And even if we were to bring that experience down a level to where we happen to be right now, does it not speak to us? Does it not say something to us? Is it not for that very reason that these words from the prophecy of Habakkuk become much more meaningful to us? Because it helps us to try and make sense of all that has been happening around us or, or even more generally in life. Now, some of us may face anxiety with regards to our job and our career and all of that. Sadly, some of us may lose loved ones or have lost loved ones. Our lives are changed. And even after this immediate crisis has passed, the government, I'm sure, will, will be trying to do things with regards to the economy, things that even as yet they don't want to tell us because it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult. Or we can think about life. And we all face disappointments and we all face those broken dreams from time to time. We do face the ravages of daily living and we face all sorts of trials. And some of us have been through all sorts of valleys and terrible moments. But still we find, and I hope that it is your experience, the experience of Habakkuk, that it rings true in your life when still everything is taken that you have Jesus and you find that having Jesus is the most important thing in your life and it is that that carries you through. Because just here in the words of Habakkuk and the experience that I'm finding is that even Habakkuk, and as we move on a little bit more, I find that Habakkuk, is, he's, now, he's actually relying on God. And that's verse 19. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Actually, when you read that, in verse 19, where it says, the Lord is my strength, literally that means the Lord is my army. What it's saying is that he provides for the person who has lost everything or for the one who has been pushed to the very limits. Now, today I've been flicking backwards and forwards in the Bible 
and I've been purposefully drawing out the experience of so many different Bible characters. And I'm doing that because I'm trying to show that this has consistently been the experience of God's people at all times and in all situations, that they have found that God is the one who has enabled them to endure and to find peace in the midst of all that seems so wrong. These people have discovered that actually Jesus, that God, he's always worth it. And despite all those uncertainties, many, many people have found that God is utterly reliable. Do you remember when Paul was writing of his thorn in the flesh and he pleaded with God to remove it? How did God respond to Paul as he prayed? 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. In that moment or in those moments, God's Holy Spirit was poured all the more into Paul's experience. That this grace overpowered him and overwhelmed him, not in spite of his thorn, but because of it. There's nothing wrong with weakness. There's nothing wrong with admitting these things. And we can find the advantage, of course, that it's making room for God's grace. And that's Paul. And again, if I go back to Jeremiah, Jeremiah was another contemporary of Habakkuk. He had a different role. Jeremiah was more so speaking into the, the, the king's life and into the government of his day. And he, and he was God's spokesman challenging these people. And here is how God encouraged Jeremiah, even as he was facing exactly the same challenges that Habakkuk was facing. Jeremiah 1 verse 18. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and all the people of the land. You know, if we are honest, we don't like challenges. We also don't like to be pushed outside of our comfort zone. I think that many of us. We like to live according to what that little thermostat that is in many of our houses. That thermostat, when trying to get the temperature just right, talks about the comfortable zone. And you and I like to live well within that comfortable zone. We're queasy at the thought of change. The thought of it makes our knees give way at times. And the result of all of that is that we like to live within these comfortable limits. But even if just now I was able to drop this word from God into the hearts and minds of those people who are responsible for this spiritual development of our congregations or thinking about all of us and what God is saying to us in these days. Under God, where is he calling each of us? What's he calling us to do in these days? And as we look into the future, what is God calling us to do? Where is he calling us to step out and to be bold and, and to make a difference for him? Could God be calling some of you to do something that's very different, to make a change? Even these changing economic situations, could this be God's wake-up call to you to get you to think about something that's different that you might be able to step outside of your comfort zone? Or if I make a music analogy that maybe up to this point, you have been enjoying easy listening and God instead wants you to enjoy some rock. Your life has been more Michael Bublé and he wants you to enjoy Bon Jovi. 
What is God saying to you in these moments? Have you become too comfortable with things? Perhaps God is calling you to make some dramatic change, maybe even a career change, maybe even Christian ministry, but you're holding back whatever that is. And of course, perhaps some who are listening may even be holding back from that understanding of God's initial call upon our lives to, to forsake all and to come and follow me. And yet, so often we think, you know, I've heard all this before. I, I understand the gospel. I know what it's all about. But still, you hold back. All of this may be God's wake-up call to us, to the people who like to live within those comfortable limits, who are frightened of doing anything different. But again, as I go back to this final verse, in verse 19, and just seeing the confidence that we have, I want you to look at the verb that is mentioned here towards the end of verse 19, where it describes and it says, he enables me. God enables me to walk on the heights. So we don't need to fear. We don't need to fear an uncertain future. We do not need to hold back from wherever it is that God is calling us to go or whatever it is that God is calling us to do because we know that God is faithful, that God is reliable, and that he will enable you. So today I simply encourage you to trust him. Let's pray. Lord, sometimes it's very hard to trust when we're unsure, when so much is changing. Lord, we thank you that you know our hearts and you know our situation. You know how faith frail and feeble we are. But what we are, Lord, we offer to you. So Lord, even in our reticence and even with the hesitation of our hearts, may we follow you whenever and wherever. Amen. Our God is sure. We can be confident in the love of Jesus and what he has for us. And our faith is confident and sure. And so we can express that even as we join together in singing the words, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
Let us pray. And now may grace, mercy, and peace from God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and remain with you all this day and always. Amen.